Greetings, Lexcog family. If we haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, I want to introduce myself. I am Pastor Jeff Craigmont, and beside him is my beautiful wife, Lisa. And we are the children's pastors here at Lexcog, and we're so thrilled to meet you today. Now today, I want to share with you the importance and excitement of Go Kids Ministry. Why is kids ministry so important? I'm so glad you asked. You see, the biggest mission field in the world are kids. 100% of kids born do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And we, and you, have the opportunity to teach them about the wonderful gospel, about the love of God, partner with parents to bring them into the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, more than half of those who will accept Christ in their lifetime will do so by the age of 12. You see, we have a very short window of opportunity to win them to Jesus Christ. Also, by the time a child is nine, their basic moral foundation has already been formed. By the time they reach the age of 13, they will have formed their own basic beliefs about the nature of God, about the reliability of the Bible, about the existence of an afterlife, and the everlasting love of Jesus Christ. Now, at Kids Ministry, we have a chance, an opportunity to engage the hearts of these children when they are most open to the gospel. You can have the opportunity as well to share the gospel with a child for the very first time, or perhaps to help them form their first thoughts of who God is. By serving in Go Kids Ministry in any capacity, you can have the real opportunity to show kids and their families that Jesus is real and that they have a purpose through Him. What kind of opportunities do we have to serve in Go Kids Ministry? Well, if you can imagine it, we can put your skills to work. You see, we have positions waiting for you right now in Kids Ministry Hospitality. All you need is a friendly smile, and you are ready to begin your journey. Other opportunities can also be found in our nursery, our preschool classes, our elementary age classes, and our kids' church. Do you like to sing? Well, we can use you. Do you like to dance? We can certainly use your skills. Do you have artistic skills? Do you like to build? Do you like to decorate? We can use you too. Maybe you like to goof off and be a character. We can certainly use you for that. Do you like to be in front of people talking? Do you like coordinating a ministry or groups of people? Are you interested in teaching? Assisting in class? Maybe you like to write cards, talk to people, or do outreach. Maybe you've always been interested in learning about how to run sound, live stream, or projection without the pressure of being in big kids' church. Do you have skills in graphic arts or like to direct others? And you just want to be involved in special or big events? We have places in all these things and so many more just for you. I want to leave you today with our key verse from Psalm 78 4. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty wonders. Will you consider joining our team today? Kids are listening to the voices around them, and we need you to be an encouraging and positive voice to teach them about the glorious power of our God. So what are you waiting for? Join us today. Make a difference in the life of a child and help lead countless generations to Jesus Christ in eternal life.
Thank you, Jesus. See you. 
Amen. Can we give the Lord praise this morning? He's so good. Lord, we thank you, God, and we give you the best of praise today, Lord. We just thank you that we have the opportunity, Lord, just to be here, God. God, although that we cannot be inside, Lord, I just thank you that we have the opportunity to meet outside, Lord. God, I just ask that today with service, Lord, that you would have your way today. God, I just ask that you'd minister to every heart, God, every mind, every soul, Lord. As we leave here today, God, we would leave here changed and transformed, God. God, by your word today, Lord, I just ask that you'd make my words your words, God. God, I just ask that you would just speak through me, God, and exactly on an on-time message of what you need to be said. Lord, I just give you the praise. I thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to quickly introduce myself. If you don't already know me, my name is Isaac Savage. Um, I've been attending here at LexCog for close to 10 years now, and what an honor and a privilege it is to call LexCog home. Um, this church really has been my home ever since I moved down to South Carolina. And uh, in one of these cars somewhere out here, my wife has joined me today with, um, her name is Sarah. And so we're so glad and honored to be here and joined in service. This message is, is something that's really been brewed on my heart for quite some time now. And uh, I know and I, I know all of us can give the Lord the best of praise the, to know that 2020 is finally over. And uh, we're very, very glad and thankful to know that 2020 and hopefully 2021 will bring us new beginnings, great restart, great recharge. And knowing that no matter what happens, God is still in control. 
You know, one thing that I, I've mentioned before, I don't, I'm not sure I've mentioned it outside in the parking lot service, but what I do know is that the year 2020, all of us had expected and all of us had hoped for this year that would be completely in, in, in just this vision and we would just see new beginnings and we would experience all that God has to offer for us and it would just be this testimony of what God is. We had, exp- we had, had hoped and prayed that that's what 2020 would be all about. And as I sit here today, I can't help but to think that we really did and truthfully had 2020 vision. 2020 was a year that we had actually seen what the world was all about, and it was broken. We saw a world that was so hurt, a world that was so burdened, a world that just so desperately needed Jesus. And today in this society, in this time, we have realized that we as the church have failed to bring Jesus to these people that are hurting and broken. We had an awesome opportunity. I had an awesome opportunity to uh, share a video with the first service. I'm going to tell you guys about it. I want you to go home and watch it. But at Google, on YouTube, whatever you want to use, you can type in Google your year 2020. And whenever you type that in, a video will pop up. It's actually made by Google. You can find it on YouTube. The most human trait is to want to know why. And in a year that tested everyone around the world, why was searched more than ever? The spread of the coronavirus has passed a significant milestone. And while we didn't find all the answers, we kept asking. Some questions inspired joy. Others, excitement. Life in the bubble. Yes. Inna me? Yes. Inna me? Yes. I don't know what an improper fraction is. Teachers should make a billion dollars. We found politics, y'all. Oh my God. Put it on there and start it up for me. What are y'all doing? It's still March. How many days in March? Some questions made us cry. You know, we've been through our ups and been through our downs. I think the most important part is that we all stay together throughout. I love you guys. Some made us worry about this spinning rock we call home. Fires were detected in the Amazon rainforest. Why were so many lives lost? Almost 1.5 million people have now died of COVID-19 worldwide. Why are we still asking the same questions? George Floyd Floyd repeatedly told the officers that he could not breathe. So why do we still have strength to continue? I believe in your power. I believe in our power. I believe in our power. Chants of Black Lives Matter echoed from thousands of protesters in cities around the world. Why are we not defeated? We have made too much progress, and we are not going back. We are going forward. Planes are starting to arrive in Beirut, full of international aid. Firefighters from around the world arriving in California. There are over 100 coronavirus vaccines in development worldwide. This is one of those times when people look out for one another and have each other's backs. We kept going for those who showed us the way. Think about how you would like the world to be for your daughters and granddaughters. Remember, the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. Press on with pride and press on with purpose. Why is it that this year showed it's its worst and we still found ways to triumph? An incredible feat for Maya Gaviera. Naomi Osaka, US Open Championship. Can't let Corona stop you. Can't let quarantine stop you. So until we get to every answer, we're still searching. And it goes through, and, and, and the number one search question, the number one search thing on Google in the year of 2020 was the question, why? Three letters, simple to some, maybe complicated for others. But what I do know is that the number one question being asked was why? Whenever there was fires spreading all over the Amazon and all over California, and we were experiencing wildfires like we've never experienced before, people would ask, why is the sky orange? Or maybe they were asking, why is the COVID-19 pandemic named COVID-19? Why are the protests happening? 
Why, why, why? And so for many of us, I I wish I had some answers. I wish that I could tell you all the answers to the question why, but I can't, unfortunately. But what I can tell you is that there's a beginning and an end, and I know a person that understands and has never left his hand not on us, and his name is Jesus, and he knew why the entire time. But what I do know is that through all of that, I was faithful, and I prayed consistently to know that no matter what happens, no matter what I could question with the question titled why, I knew that God was still in control, but I kind of, I had preached a message close to 10 months ago here at LexCog, and it was titled, The Alarm is Sounding. And so it's funny, Brother Mark Akers, he he had pulled me off to the side this morning, and he said, are you going to preach on a message that the alarm has finally snoozed? Because if you think about it, the alarm has still been sounding. And to this day, we're still struggling with the fact of knowing that we're not quite sure what to do with this alarm that's sounding. But the title of my message today, and and I'm really excited about this message, and it's, when will your desperation be worth more than your reputation? When will you finally understand and comprehend that everything that you've worked for, your reputation really means nothing at all? In the scheme of things, what we can understand is that Christ is still in control. And what I want you to understand today, church, is that there has to be a church body that is willing to stand up and say that no matter what happens, no matter what people make fun of, I'm willing 110% to stand up for Christ and serve him as as he deserves to be served. And so I stand here today to say to you, church, are you more concerned with your reputation? Are you ready just to get down? and get into the nitty gritty and to get ready to serve Christ like you've never served him before. You might have to give up your Fortune 500 job. You might have to give up your position that's so high up. You have to be willing and understanding to know that sometimes when you get desperate for Jesus, there's going to be some people that you have to leave behind. Church, when are you going to realize that your sons and daughters bringing the things that they do inside of your home eventually has to cease? When are you going to realize that your husband and wife, whatever you allow them to bring into the home, when are you going to realize that that has to cease? Families have to get desperate for Jesus. We have got to come to a place today where we understand that serving Christ is the most important thing that we can do. But unfortunately, in today's society, we don't understand that. We don't see that. We don't comprehend that. And so I stand here today to tell you that God is waiting for you. Jesus is waiting for you. If you will, join me in the book of Luke chapter 8. I'm going to be preaching on the woman with the issue of blood. And she had fought this thing. She was bleeding for 12 years. I have some, um, some facts about what 12 years is, and, and, and it's, it's pretty sobering if you ask me. And so for 12 years, in our time, that is 4,380 days. That's 105,120 hours. And my most favorite, it's 6,307,200 minutes. This woman spent six million minutes consumed by this problem on the inside of her. And she had spent everything that she had. She used her whole livelihood to try to find a way to get healed. She went to physician after physician, to doctor after doctor, went to all these people that said that could help her. And I'm about to get to the passage, but in Scripture it talks about how after she went to all these, she actually got worse. Now, like many of you, I have a doctor that I trust, that I go to. And I'm sure like all of you, you also have a doctor that you trust and you go to. If you don't have a doctor, a dentist, somebody that you go to that is classified in the medical field. And so could you imagine going to your doctor and you walk into the room and you tell him your problem, your condition, and he says, oh, I can help you. You leave there worse than whenever you walked in. Much help he was. 
And then I, I, I told the first service about sometimes, I, I don't like to admit it, but sometimes I get lost in the abyss of Facebook. And, you know, you click on a video. Whenever you click on the video, it gives you a thousand more videos that you can watch. And, and you just get lost scrolling through these videos watching. One of my favorite kind of videos to watch is doctor videos. You know, some of the chiropractors on there, some of the surgeons. There, there's tons of really cool things that you can watch and learn. And so I... I Whenever I watch them, I, I tend to think that these people that they're recording in these videos travel all around the country, all around the world, because they have a back pain, they have a knee pain, they have some sort of heart pain, and they can't find a way to get rid of it. And so they saw this doctor on social media all over the Internet saying that this guy can fix everybody. And so whenever you get, are so desperate, you realize that I, I can't afford the trip, but I'm in so much pain, I'm struggling so badly that I've got to see this doctor. And so you decide that you have an extra car in the backyard. You sell the extra car and you get to go. You go to this doctor and next thing you know, he doesn't fix you, but he makes you worse. So you post a recommendation on Facebook. Whenever you post it on Facebook, you, you go and find this other doctor that so-and-so recommended. You go see him. You can't afford it. Your medical bills, all your credit cards are maxed out. And so next thing you know, you go sell something else. Next thing you know, you go see doctor after doctor. And you've sold everything that you've had. You've given away everything that you had. You have nothing left. But yet now you are bleeding worse than you ever were before. And now let me set the scene. This woman was bleeding. And so whenever this woman was bleeding, she was seen as unclean. She had to, so most of the time when it only lasts seven days, on the, you go through your seven days, you consecrate yourself, you put yourself in your home, you stay away from everybody. Because whenever you're viewed as unclean, if I touch this post, you come by and touch this post. Now you are considered unclean. I don't want to take away from the story, but we can relate it back to the coronavirus. If I have COVID-19, I drive my car, you get in my car and you drive it. Possibilities of you having COVID increased by many. Now you would be considered having a direct contact, as the CDC says, and you would then have to go get tested and you would have to quarantine. And so I go through all of that to say that this woman was viewed as unclean for 12 complete years. 4,000 days she struggled with this of knowing that she was unclean. I couldn't imagine my mind. I had to quarantine for, oh, I, I took five days to get my test back. So I had to quarantine for five days. I was going nuts in my house. My wife was like, you need to go do something in the yard. Go find something to do. We couldn't leave. We couldn't go anywhere. But I just had to leave my house. I couldn't imagine how this woman had to feel whenever she was stuck inside of her home, fully clothed, could not touch anything, probably had nothing left. So join me in Luke chapter 8. And I'm going to be in verse 40. Verse 40. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him. For they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians, could not be healed by any. That's kind of what I was just talking about, how this woman had struggled with this for so long, spent everything that she had on all the doctors that she could. I, I like the, the way that Mark puts it in chapter 5 of Mark. I'll, I'll meet you back in Luke. Mark chapter 5, verse 26, and had suffered many things from many physicians. Excuse me, physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. That's, that's Mark's way of interpreting it. So both Mark and Luke are saying that this woman went to these doctors and got no better. In fact, got worse, had nothing left, spent everything that she had. And so now this woman is walking around, can't do anything with herself, can't be seen by people, has to cover herself, can't touch anything because if she finds out that she's stuck out in public, the consequences would be great for her. Luke chapter 8, verse 44. She came from behind and touched the border of his garment, talking about Jesus here. And so immediately once she had touched the garment of Jesus, her bleeding had stopped. And so I want to set the scene here. This woman was not allowed to be out in public, was not allowed to be out anywhere, could not be seen, could not touch anything, because if she did, in that moment, this 
person, that thing, would have to be considered unclean. So as you can imagine, this woman is, uh, Jesus is walking through this town to head to Jairus' daughter to try to heal her. And whenever he's walking around, you get, it says the multitudes. I can only imagine the amount of people. I just imagine every single one of you gets out of your car and comes meet here in the middle. And I put one person in the middle and say, that's Jesus. And then in that moment, I had to try to be this woman and had to fight through the crowd, completely covering myself because I couldn't let any of you recognize that I was the woman that was unclean. So I fight through the crowd and the only thing that I can get a touch on, the only thing that I can touch is the very tip of Jesus' garment. I can only imagine the way that she felt whenever she felt her finger brush across, across his garment. And in, in, in that moment, she knew that something had happened, a transformation happened inside of her body. And now immediately, I love that word, immediately. There was no, she had to go home and pray and fast. It, it, there was no other kind of moment. She didn't have to talk to Jesus. The moment that she touched the garment, she was healed. Now, if you don't call that desperate, I don't know what else you would. But in that moment, she was so desperate to get a touch from God that she went fighting through the multitudes just to get a touch. She didn't grab Jesus' hand. She didn't hug Jesus. She didn't grab his foot. Instead, she just touched whatever she could possibly get her hand on. Let's keep moving. And so in verse 45, and Jesus said, who touched me? And when all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? I love Peter's boldness sometimes to say, Jesus, are you crazy? You've got all these people around you. What do you mean who touched you? What do you mean who touched you? This is, this is my next favorite part. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. And so now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all of the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. We'll pick up back in verse 48. I can only imagine the moment that she realized that she was completely healed. She was no longer considered unclean because she had finally got a touch from the father. But in that moment, she got busted because now all of these people knew that there was some sort of healing power that went out. And whenever she heard that she was no longer hidden, I can only imagine the state that she was in on her knees, just pleading with Jesus, how sorry that she was just pleading with him. Jesus, listen, I've been dealing with this for 12 years. I'm exhausted. I feel so lonely. I'm all alone, Jesus. You don't understand. I needed that touch. I needed the healing. I think about some of you in the cars today, how you've been dealing with cancer for so long. Maybe you've been dealing with something silent. You've been depressed for far too long. Maybe you're one of your family members has been sick for far too long. Who knows? Maybe it's 12 years. Maybe it's been five years. It could be 20 years you've been dealing with this. But what I do know is that this lady was so desperate. She was willing to bust through the crowd to just get a touch. And I thought about you today, church. I think about me and I think about each and every single one of you. How desperate we need to be just to get a touch to Jesus. How important it is that we realize that we have to find a way to be so desperate that we stop worrying about the things going on around us. But instead, we put all of our present attention on what Jesus is and who he is and what he stands for in our lives. And we pursue him with everything that we have. Verse 48 in chapter 8 of Luke. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well and go in peace. Your faith has made you well. So now go in peace. It was as simple as a touch. And I think about all too long how the church has overcomplicated this thing. And something I was telling the first service is that don't take away from the story, but plug your name into that story. Isaac for 12 years had battled this disease. 
and he could not walk and he could not talk and he lost everything that he had and he had hundreds of thousands of dollars piled up in medical bills. He could no longer work. He was disabled. He couldn't do this and he couldn't do that. And all of this time he had struggled. And finally, Isaac got so desperate that he walked down to the altar. He got down in his prayer closet. He kneeled down beside his bed. He got down on his knees and he pleaded with the father and said, Father, I don't know what else to do. I've lost everything that I've had, but please, please. And finally, in that moment, Isaac feels a touch that he's never felt before. He knew that whenever that medicine was flowing through his body, it wasn't going to work. But in that moment, when he felt that touch from Jesus, everything began to change inside of his body, inside of his mind. In that moment, could you imagine whenever you sit at the doctor's office and a doctor gives you a pill and you swallow that pill and inside your brain, inside your body, you feel something move and you know that instantaneously that you're healed? No doctor on this side of glory, I believe, can give you that kind of pill. But I can tell you about a man named Jesus that what he can do is he can just simply give you a touch. With this woman, we found out that Jesus doesn't even have to touch us. We have to touch him. She reached out her hand and caught the corner of his garment. Church, I'm trying to explain to you today how simple it can be. The same Bible that I'm reading to you today, the same story I'm reading to you today, many of you have on your phones, many of you have at home sitting on the shelf, dusty. But church, when are you going to find out that you are going to be so desperate that sometimes you just need to just get down on your knees and say, God, I'm desperate for you. God, I need you more than I ever have ever in my life before. But here's the thing, whenever the pastor stands on stage and he says, every head bowed, every eye closed, and then he says those words, and you know that altar call is about to begin. And so he sits there and, and, and he preached an entire message and God sat right in front of you and said, this is for you, this is for you. And then that pastor says, I want everyone that, if, if under the sound of my voice, if this message was for you, I want you to come down front and I want to pray over you. I want to just be able to speak blessing over you. In that moment, instantaneously, everything that runs through your mind is that you realize that everyone's going to see you whenever you walk down to the altar. Everyone's going to notice you. Everyone's going to know that you have some sort of problem that you can't fix. No longer can you hide behind the facade of a smile. Now everyone can hide behind their masks. You don't even have to smile anymore. We can't see your mouth anyways. So now you can walk around continuing to de deal with this problem because you refuse to be so desperate to go get on your knees and pray and say, God, I can't do this any longer. God, I can't struggle with this any longer. God, I need you. But church, we went through a full year being quarantined. We went through a full year, excuse me, 10 months of having to stay at home, of businesses being shut down, governments being shut down, entire countries being shut down, having to close schools, having to close churches. We went through all of this, but we refused to get down on our knees and seek the one that can fix all of this. Truth be told, I don't think that a shot is going to fix this. I don't think that the masks are going to fix this. I don't think that all the precautions we can take are going to fix this. If I'm being 100% honest, I think all of us should take the proper precaution in every way that we possibly can. But if we want to see true change ensue upon the body of Christ, if we want to see true change ensue upon the world, it's going to take a church that is willing to drop to their knees at any given moment and give the God that we serve the best of praise, the most glory, and serve him as we deserve. It takes a church willing to be desperate, whatever it takes. I can't help to think I don't have any kids, but I can't help to think about how my mom used to tell me when I was a little kid. 
that it did not matter what would happen to me. That no matter if a bear was running full speed ahead, if a train was chugging along the tracks and it was going to hinder me, kill me, hurt me. My mom told me from a little young age that said there is nothing that's going to come in between the love that I hold for you. There's nothing that's going to come in between me saving your life over mine. And I remember thinking that as my mom, and I used to think that I still to this day think that my mom is a superhero. Why? Because I know that at my mom's house, at my father's house, no matter where I am inside their house, as long as I'm under their protection, I know that I'm okay. Because that's what they told me. Church, can I tell you about how God wrote you an entire book that told you that you would be okay? He gave you a way out. He told you how you can find healing. An entire book. Wrote it in thousands of different languages. Published it. Small print, large print, you name it. Can't read? Great. We got virtual books as well. You think it's boring? They've got thousands of different kinds of speakers, slow speakers, fast speakers, loud speakers, quiet speakers. You name it. But what I can say is that God laid all of this stuff out for you so that you could find him and you could pursue him, but you've got to be willing to lay down everything that you have. You have to be willing to dedicate yourself completely and totally to the word of God and taking every word. Allowing it, to follow, allowing it to light your path and you following every word. It's a road map. I just talked about how this person, this lady had struggled with this disease for 12 years, had struggled with the issue of blood for 12 years. I'm sure there's people sitting in this car that have struggled with some sort of disease. Infectious, inside your brain, whatever it is, whatever you struggle with, what somebody in their car has struggled with that. And I just showed you a way out. We said that 2020 was the worst year of our lives, but guess what? That's the perfect way to start. All of us say that eventually we're going to hit rock bottom. If you ask me, the world's hit rock bottom with 2020. We saw some of the worst things that we could probably ever see in our lifetime. But guess what, church? The world is waiting for some sort of hope. The world is asking why, and when is the church going to stand up and tell them? How vital is it that you understand that the church is the body? Great, we come and gather in front of this building. Wonderful, but this building is not the church. The church is in each and every single one of you. Every single one of you is a key member of the body. And when will you understand that when we band together into one accord and go out with full force and preach the word of God? We've been battling the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been struggling with these protests. We've been struggling because people can't understand that you are just supposed to love one another. Something so simple. Jesus tells us to love your neighbor as yourself, but yet we still struggle. Why? Because there hasn't been a church so desperate willing to go into all the world, taking the great commission with every last word that it means and go into all the world and preach the good news of who Jesus Christ is and was. We serve a living God. Each and every single one of us, if you believe that, we serve a God that is no longer inside of the tomb. What a big deal that is. I want to shout it from the rooftops. But the thing is, is that we have a church that's not willing to say it. So I say all of these examples to say is church, we have to be desperate. We've got to understand that no matter what happens, that there are some times where we're going to have to give up being cool, and there's going to have to be some times where we give up the money. If you can't pay tithes because your car bill's too high, unfortunately, I left my keys in the sanctuary, but I held up my car keys, and if I can't afford my truck, and I'm having to give up paying tithes or give, give up giving offerings, then I don't deserve to have that truck. If you have a house that you can't afford the mortgage and you've got to give away or you can't give away your money to the church or pay tithes or give offerings, that's a problem. 
Many people say, I just want to have a great life for my kids. Your kids will have a great life. If you just teach them the importance of knowing and serving Christ with everything that they have from their wallets to their bodies. Serving is so much more. But yet we're not desperate enough to get plugged in. We're not desperate enough to find a community. We're not desperate enough. In Christ, we can find hope. In Christ, we can find peace. In Christ, we can find joy. We can find love. You've got to be passionate. You've got to be ready. You've got to be willing. You've got to be at any given moment. If Christ tells you to go, you've got to be ready to go. It's so important. I just told the story of this woman. Now I want each and every single one of you to take a moment and, and think back on a time where you were so desperate that you just needed a touch. Maybe you needed a spiritual touch. Maybe you just needed a healing touch. Maybe that your family was struggling. You didn't know where else to go, what else to do. I'm sure all of us have had a moment like that when you finally hit rock bottom. The bank was on the way to come foreclose your house. You didn't know what else to do and you were just praying there knowing that it's 20 minutes from the bank to your house and you've got 20 minutes to find some way to come up with your mortgage that month and catch up. But God comes in and he sends a blessing. Someone calls you and says, hey, brother Isaac, I've got $1,000 for you and your mortgage is $999. I'm going to come and drop off this money so it can be a blessing to you. That's how God works. That's what God does. But you have to be desperate and willing to give everything that you have and pray and seek and worship. Scripture tells us how to do it. You've got to go find it. I'm about to close this thing down. I wish that I could come and, and lay hands on you. But if you will, if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me, I'm, I'm going to take us to the Lord in prayer. Finishing up kind of early. It means I went too fast. But today, somebody in this car, somebody in their mind, somebody in their homes, maybe you know somebody that's struggling. Maybe one of your family members has been dealing with this cancer that's consuming all of her body and she's not sure where else to go. Maybe your mom or your dad don't know who Jesus is and, and you've been trying to minister to them in some way, but they're just not understanding where to go. Maybe your brother or your sister are making decisions that you don't understand why, but you just know that they just need a touch from Jesus. Maybe it's you yourself today. Maybe there's one of you sitting in the car and you know that you've walked so far away from Christ, you don't know how to get back. But what I do know is that there's a way out. Unfortunately, the, the 2020 suicide results have not come out. The, the statistics haven't come out. But I was looking at the 2018. And from 2018... They did a study from 2009 to 2018, nine years, and they showed the upward trend of how suicide has progressed only in the United States. In church, it was a straight line up, it seemed like. People are waiting and seeking and just looking for some way to find hope. They don't understand why these things are happening. I don't either. But what I do know is I serve a God that is so faithful. I serve a God that is so holy that is going to protect me through all of it. Whenever you're in your father's house, whenever you're under the father's protection, there's nothing that can hinder you because God's got you. So church, no more excuses. Church, no more taking, taking leaves away from God. No more saying that God just isn't working out right now. No more excuses. Church, we have to find a way to be desperate for Christ. Come hell or high water, I'm going to serve God no matter what. And I hope that you'll band with me as a body of believers and we can go into Lexington, South Carolina and bring the word. Like I've said before, it starts in South Carolina. Could you imagine the bubbling effect of what's going to happen? We start in Lexington. A, a huge revival breaks out. Next thing you know, thousands of people are showing up and we don't have enough room for them. And this revival starts to spread. It spreads into Columbia, South Carolina, our state's capital. It hits Columbia. It spreads from Columbia all to the surrounding cities and counties. And as it begins to spread, it spreads further and further. Then we hit Georgia. We hit North Carolina. This thing spreads further. 
Next thing you know, the whole eastern seaboard is broken out in revival and we start to shift across the Midwest, then we hit the West Coast. Next thing you know, all of America has broken out in revival. Could you imagine? All of America breaks out in revival. We start to move to these other countries. We hit China. We hit Japan. We go into Russia. We go into England. We go into all of Africa. We go to all these places and start to bring the word of Christ. Guys, it sounds simple. And maybe it is. But what I do know is that it takes a church body. It takes a people willing to be desperate for Christ and give everything that they have to make this thing work. To go into all the world and preach the good news of who Jesus Christ really is. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you, Lord. God, I give you the praise, Lord. I give you the honor, Lord. And I just thank you that we have the opportunity to be here today. God, I thank you for the word that you've given, God. And I just ask, Lord, it wouldn't fall on deaf ears today, God. But whenever we leave here, God, we leave transformed and changed, God, knowing, Lord, that at any given moment, God, whenever we just feel that we need a touch from you, God, that we would understand that whenever we hit our knees, God, things can begin to change, God. The spirit can begin to fall, God. God, out of the words of our mouth, God, to the prayer that we give to you, God, to the worship we give to you, I just ask, God, that you'd begin to inhabit. God, that we would give you everything that we have. God, nothing is worth anything more than you, God. Lord, Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would have your way, God. God, in each and every single one of these families represented here today, I just ask that you would run rampant, God, that the Holy Spirit, Lord, would come in and invade, God, like a hurricane. God, ceasing to exist, anything that would come in between you, God. God, I just give you the praise, Lord. I give you the honor. I thank you, God, that we get to serve you on this beautiful day. God, I ask that you'd bring us back, God, God, in complete condition. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen.